This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Friday, October 2nd. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on. And we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. We begin our broadcast with the stunning news that U.S. President Donald Trump has contracted COVID-19 just 32 days before the presidential election. In the early hours Friday morning, the president announced via Twitter that he and First Lady Melania Trump had tested positive for the coronavirus. President Trump tweeted, Tonight, the First Lady and I tested positive for COVID-19 and will begin our quarantine and recovery process immediately. A short time later, the White House released a memorandum from the 74-year-old president's physician, Dr. Sean Conley, confirming the positive tests for the Trumps. The president and first lady are both well at this time, and they plan to remain at home within the White House during their convalescence, according to Conley. All of Trump's political events for the near future were quickly ordered canceled, according to a White House official. The news immediately caused U.S. stock futures to plunge and potentially put Trump's presidential campaign into hiatus barely one month before the election against former Vice President Joe Biden. The news on Trump comes just hours after one of his closest aides, Hope Hicks, was confirmed to be infected. Nearly 7.3 million people in the United States have been infected with COVID-19 and more than 207,000 have died, the most reported by any country, according to Johns Hopkins University data. For continuing updates on the president's status, visit voanews.com. A Zimbabwean charity funded primarily by the United States government is helping small farmers to improve product quality and yields to increase incomes and become more food secure. Feed the Future Zimbabwe says smallhold farms make up 70% of Zimbabwe's farmers and making them more efficient could help restore the country's lost status as the breadbasket of Africa. Columbus Mabunga reports from Chirumanzu, Zimbabwe. It's a tale of two ways of life in Usunuko village in Chiruman's district about 200 kilometers south of Harare. Life for the haves and the have-nots. The difference lies in dairy farming, says this 80-year-old woman. She started her farm about five years ago, thanks to Feed the Future. If I can get more resources to get more cattle and sell more milk, funds come daily while just seated at home. Feed the Future Zimbabwe is a local non-governmental organization funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development. The group says it has empowered more than 13,000 smallholder farmers over the past five years. It offers training to farmers on how to improve product quality and yields while holding down costs and ultimately making the country more food secure. When the government is, is giving inputs, the farmer must also have something substantial which he has to be putting in, not just receiving. Felistas Guatipeza now sells milk to a Zimbabwe stock exchange listed company and is able to look after her orphaned grandchildren. The Zimbabwe government says smallholder farmers have an important role to play in the country's economy and will be the target of a government initiative to give them the seeds and fertilizer they need. The smallholder far farmers are critical in, in, in this whole equation of food security. We're targeting 1.8 million households and what we are looking at that 1.8 million is we're looking at 1.8 million metric tons of cereal crops 
and 360,000 uh, metric tons of, of oil seeds. With this initiative, training from Feed the Future Zimbabwe and a forecast of a favorable rainy season ahead, farmers are hoping this year, after two decades, Zimbabwe will begin to regain its status as the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Columbus Mavunga, for VOA News, Harare. Sudanese women played a pivotal role in ousting former President Omar al-Bashir in 2019 as Sudan's transitional government moves toward democracy for the first time in decades, women are again playing a key role in seeking justice and equality. Nava Muhyiddin reports from Khartoum. Sudanese women played a prominent role organizing the protests that ousted former President Omar al-Bashir in 2019 after 30 years in power. Since then, Women are playing a prominent role in the transitional government. A woman has been appointed a chief justice, the first, not only in Sudan, but in the entire Arab world. An unprecedented four women were appointed to cabinet positions in the new government, including the country's first female minister of foreign affairs, Asma Muhammad Abdullah. But women are still marching to amend the laws and restore the rights taken from them under the strict Islamic code enforced by Bashir's government. The Sudanese Professionals Association, or SPA, was one of the key groups behind the protest that led to Bashir's ouster. Samahir al-Mubarak, who heads the SPA's Pharmacist Association, remains active in politics. I've never felt that we've reached a level where we should stop. So the motivation that powered people to overthrow the Bashir regime is the same motivation that is pushing people to continue to reach the revolution's goals of freedom, peace, and justice. The June 3, 2019 crackdown on pro-democracy protesters in Khartoum left more than 120 people dead, including the eldest son of Amir al-Kabous. His death didn't deter Kabous from being involved, and she's now the deputy chief of an organization of people who lost relatives in the uprising. What we are doing is the continuance of the martyrs' role and their sacrifices. We didn't reach our goals yet. We didn't see the freedom, peace, and justice the martyrs demanded. We will continue until we achieve all of the revolution's goals that our children sacrificed for and to restore the rights till we see Sudan the way our children dreamt about and we all are dreaming about. Kabuz and al-Mubarak were recently awarded the 2020 Freedom House Award for their role in advancing democratic change in Sudan. The award was under the theme of the power of protest. Naba Muhyiddin for VUA News, Khartoum. A group of Malawi women are changing lives in villages that have long lived without power by installing and maintaining solar equipment in homes and schools. The women, known as the Solar Mamas, were trained in India as solar engineers with sponsorship from charities. The Solar Power is helping rural students to study at night and families to earn more income. Lamek Masina reports from Lilongwe. They may look like ordinary villagers, but these Malawian women are trained solar engineers. They are helping to bridge the power gap in rural Malawi, a country where only 10% of the population is connected to the power grid. Charity groups, bare food and voluntary services overseas sponsored the women's six months program in India. We trained the illiterate women uh, because we believed that education is not just in the classroom. And we wanted to tell people that uh, even women can be solar engineers. So we purposely selected the older women that were above 45 years old and who did not go past 75. The women became known as the solar mamas and have brought solar power to over 200 households in the villages around Malawi's capital, Lilongwe. The skills we learn from India are very beneficial to us because once we install or repair the solar equipment, we are given money that helps us meet our daily needs. The program helped some villagers get into the battery charging trade and remove lengthy travel to charge mobile phones. The solar mamas have also connected schools with solar power allowing students for the first time to attend classes in the early mornings and evenings. The coming of solar power here has helped me a lot because in the past I was unable to study at night at home because my parents are poor and could not afford a lamp or a flashlight. But now I can come here at night to study and work on assignments.
the solar mamas are also training Malawi's youth in solar engineering so they can become the next generation of solar mamas and papas. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Lilongwe. We'll be right back. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. Lawmakers in Washington back from the August recess have yet to reach a compromise relief package for millions of Americans facing financial hardship due to the coronavirus pandemic. Among the hardest hit are the millions of renters facing eviction after their enhanced federal unemployment benefits came to an end and eviction bans were lifted. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has since moved to reinstate the ban on evictions through the end of the year. In the meantime, many local groups and nonprofits throughout the United States are stepping up to help those still in need. VOS Julie Tamo has more. Do let me know um, if you guys need anything. Across the U.S., people are reaching out to those facing eviction because of the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic. If you can, send me the, the names and the addresses. One of those people is Jennifer Meyer Conklin, who founded an organization that helps those in need find temporary housing. More than 40 percent of renters are at risk of eviction in her home state of Oklahoma, according to Statistica.com. We will see a large increase in our homeless population and a much larger increase still in our working, what they call the working poor. Um, and that is people who have jobs and they are still struggling to find a place, a safe place to rent. Across the country in Woodbridge, Virginia, Rose Powers is also trying to help. I'm glad you came to us. She's the executive director and co-founder of Streetlight a nonprofit that works with those in need in the local area. Rent evictions has always been an issue in Prince William County as well as Northern Virginia. The cost of housing is just too high for many, many families. Minority communities have been hit the hardest. Around 550,000 renters, mostly African-American and Latino families, may be evicted in Virginia alone, according to Voice a nonpartisan coalition of 50 faith and community organizations in Northern Virginia. I do believe that in this pandemic, uh, some of the people that are paying the highest price are those people who are low income, people who were restaurant servers, people who may be uh, hairstylists, uh, they worked in small businesses, and they were not um, given the opportunity to work from home. They simply were laid off. Powers has been helping people like Tonya, who was laid off by a temp agency in November. My assignment was up in November, but the agency told me because of the COVID that they wasn't doing any more assignments. And because of the COVID, um, it got worse as, as time went on, and we, there was no jobs out here. Tonya said she received some federal assistance under the CARES Act and help from other local agencies but it wasn't enough to keep up with the rent. Couldn't sleep, my blood pressure went up, just couldn't really eat, you know, because I just, I don't want to be homeless. But with help from Streetlight, she says, she's feeling more secure. So I'm doing much better now because of them helping out. Well, right now, uh, my rent is almost paid for the whole, foot in full for August, and I'm just gonna be looking for a job. That's what I'm gonna be doing. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently issued an order to temporarily halt residential evictions to prevent the further spread of COVID-19. The order will be in effect through December 31st, 2020. Julie Tabo, VOA News, Washington.
U.S. President Donald Trump is warning that he won't go along with an election result based on mail-in ballots he alleges are fraudulent. To prevent the spread of the deadly coronavirus, some states are expanding voting by mail and polling indicates significantly more Democrats than Republicans are relying on this method to cast their ballots. In addition to the possibility Trump will challenge the election results in court if he loses, BOS brand pardon reports there are growing concerns. His campaign will also try to persuade the Electoral College to overturn the popular vote in states where Democratic candidate Joe Biden is deemed the winner. At the end of Tuesday's presidential debate, the two major political party candidates were asked if they would refrain from declaring victory until the election results were independently certified. Democratic candidate Joe Biden agreed. Once the winner is declared after all the, all the ballots are counted, all the votes are counted, that'll be the end of it. That'll be the end of it. And if it's me, in fact, fine. If it's, if it's not me, I'll support the outcome. But President Trump equivocated and repeated unsubstantiated charges of massive fraud from mail-in votes that could undermine the election. I am 100 percent on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. However, Trump's own FBI director, Christopher Wray, has said there is no evidence of widespread mail-in voter fraud this year. Trailing in the polls, Trump has indicated his campaign will mount legal challenges to contest mail-in ballots if he does not win, challenges that could end up being decided by the Supreme Court. Meantime, the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to replace the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is being pushed through the Senate by the president and his party. There is also reporting that Trump, citing voter fraud, may ask Republican-led state governments to override the popular vote in the Electoral College if Biden wins. The Trump campaign has denied these reports. In the Electoral College, established over 200 years ago, state legislatures use the outcome of the popular vote to select electors from the victorious party who then cast the official ballots on behalf of the population of their respective states. Overriding the popular vote, analysts say, could greatly undermine public confidence in democracy itself. And that you could see then enrage um, many of its citizens who had voted and anticipated that their votes would count. The Electoral College has become increasingly controversial after declaring George W. Bush the winner of the 2000 presidential election and then again in 2016 awarding Donald Trump the presidency even though both lost the national popular vote. While many Democrats now advocate for abolishing the Electoral College, Republicans defend this indirect voting system because it allocates proportionally more electors to rural states. So that means candidates have to try to um, appeal to a much broader, wider segment of the American populace rather than just going to the big cities um, and, and campaigning there. This potential new electoral college controversy over mail-in voting analysts say could end up producing no clear winner. In that case, the House of Representatives would be called upon to choose the next president. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. U.S. lawmakers have been meeting this week with President Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court judge, Amy Coney Barrett, who would fill the seat left empty by the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg if confirmed as expected. Barrett will have a critical impact on court decisions on a range of issues impacting life in the United States, from abortion to health care to this November's presidential election. VOA's congressional correspondent, Catherine Gibson, reports. The historic confirmation battle over U.S. federal judge Amy Coney Barrett kicked off on Capitol Hill this week as Senate Republicans met and praised the mother of seven nominated by President Donald Trump late last month. President Trump has nominated exactly the kind of outstanding person whom the American people deserve to have on their highest court. The death of liberal judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg left the U.S. Supreme Court with only eight justices just weeks before Election Day. Republicans argue that without Barrett on the court, there is a risk that an evenly split court would be unable to decide any conflict over the presidential election. It would create a constitutional crisis. That's part of the reason the Senate needs to act and act swiftly 
so that we have nine justices that can resolve any issue. But Democrats say that is the very reason Barrett should not be confirmed. Democrats are pressing her to recuse herself uh, should she be seated, given that she was appointed by someone that will ultimately be on the ballot, who she might decide to either to keep in power or to decide uh, to remove him from power. If seated, Barrett would also immediately hear a key case deciding the legality of the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, the program expanding access to health insurance passed during the Obama administration. This is not a joke to the 20 million Americans who could lose their health insurance if the ACA is struck down. Not a joke to the parent of a child who has cancer, who would have to watch helpless as their child suffers if protections for pre-existing conditions are struck down. Republicans argue the ACA overreaches and their not yet released plan would cover pre-existing conditions. The 48-year-old Barrett could serve for decades on the court, making key decisions that will impact the lives of young voters like Sean Yetter. I'm not a huge fan of Barrett. Um, she, um, a lot of, some of her opinions on like health care, on like access to health care and specific rights, I think are counterintuitive. I think it's a step backwards from progress Ruth Bader Ginsburg had made. But Barrett's confirmation would be seen as a win for many anti-abortion conservatives who have praised Trump's court nominations. You're seeing policies that are being passed right now that are supporting the pro-life movement and they're supporting women. Democratic voters are concerned the devoutly Catholic judge will overturn decisions on abortion and gay marriage. I don't necessarily want someone's own personal religious views affecting the decision for everyone. Judge Barrett has said her faith does not influence her judicial decisions, a concern congressional Democrats expressed at her 2017 confirmation hearing for a federal judgeship. The dogma lives loudly within you, and that's of concern. Republicans say such concerns violate a key American value. Her religion and how she practices her religion ought not to be a disqualifier because we appreciate freedom of religion. Barrett's confirmation hearings get underway on October 12th and the Senate could hold a full floor vote on her nomination as early as October 26th. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. In our entertainment report, since the outbreak of COVID-19, most live music concerts and festivals have canceled or gone virtual. Heather Maxwell, host of the VOA radio program, Music Time in Africa, did some digging to bring you up to speed on what's happening with some of the world's biggest African music festivals. In Montreal, Canada, the international music festival Nuit d'Afrique kicked off September 27th, and it's a lot different. It has gone 100% virtual. I spoke with Suzanne Rousseau, the general manager of the festival, just a few days ago to get more of the details. This year, the festival, we couldn't present it in July. Usually it's every year around mid-July for 13 days. And usually we have indoor and free outdoor show. And really the outdoor show is where like thousands of festival goers yes. come and see free shows on the stage. I, I remember, I've been there. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. So this summer we were getting ready to present. And uh, in April, everything stopped. So we decided to present for 34 days for this 34th reinvented edition mm -hmm. uh, with it's supposed to be 25 indoor shows and eight of the 25 shows will be filmed and broadcast but our government announced that all concert venues clubs restaurants must close until october 28th those web broadcasts will be even more important we were almost crying when we were listening live the news and then we picked up ourselves and said, listen, we're going to work very hard on those um, web broadcasts. So that, that's, that's how we're, we're seeing things now. And we're getting ready to, to make the best of it. 
Now, Suzanne also told me that while you're watching the concert, this is every Saturday, you can interact and they will respond, so that can be kind of fun and cool. Also, if you ask me, I would say the one to really watch is Wesley. Mika Ben, Wesley. On a grandi dans un ghetto, mais c'est tout ce qu'il faut, mon vieux. Ah, yeah. Na na na. Pourquoi juge si souvent quand on sait qu'on évolue avec le temps? Now, one of the biggest international African music festivals on the continent, well, actually, it's just off the continent, off the coast of Tanzania, in Zanzibar, in the Indian Ocean, is Saudi Zabusara. I spoke with its founder and CEO, Yusuf Mahamoud, also a few days ago, to see how that festival is shaping up for its next edition, which is due in February 2021. And here's what he's got to say. So in Tanzania, honestly, I can say for the past few months, life has been going on pretty much as normal. So bearing in mind travel restrictions, challenges in fundraising and other uncertainties. We took the decision to go ahead with the festival next year, but instead of having four days to downscale a little bit to two days edition, and we'll provide a platform that shows African music is alive and kicking. Uh, we're not going to enforce wearing of masks or social distancing at the festival, but additional safety measures will be in place. I'm so excited that Saudi Zabusara is actually happening in 2021. And don't be surprised, Yusuf, if you see me there. And I really, really hope to see you in Zanzibar in February. Uh, it's called the friendliest festival on the planet for a reason. <laughs> and I uh, really hope you can come and share the magic with us. All right, so since this festival is not until February 2021, you have time to get updated regularly by going to the busaramusic.org site or just following Saudi Zabusara on social media. And with that, I say goodbye and wish you a great weekend. And I'm going to send you off with another little clip of a video by one of the artists that is coming to perform at the Saudi Zabusara Festival. His name is Morena Larabi, and Yusuf told me that he learned all of his music whilst shepherding in the mountains of the Sutu. See you next week. <laughs> That was Heather Maxwell with our Friday Entertainment Report. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.